The topic that the topic that I want to take up this afternoon is one that uh, um, I've just been enjoying over the past few months a little bit. Actually, in the summer, we had somebody visiting our area, Francois Leger, and uh, he had had a gospel here, and he spoke about two people. And uh, right at the end of it, he just commented on, it was the, one of the two people was, was um, Rahab. And he commented at the end of the meeting how incredible it was that the Lord allowed her to marry the daughter of a prince. And I hadn't really thought of it in that context before in terms of her marrying the daughter of a prince. And uh, I decided to do a little bit of digging. I knew that the princes were mentioned quite a bit in the book of Numbers. And so I just went back and I just was thoroughly refreshed as I went through the topic and dug into it for myself. And, and that's what I wanna share with you today. Um, I've been encouraged over and over in going through the stories in the lineage of the Lord, of the Lord's incredible, or the incredible grace that comes out there, obviously ending in his, his birth. And so where I'd like to start is just um, to read those verses in the New Testament um, where this prince is mentioned. His name is Nashon, and uh, he's the, the father of Salmon, who married Rahab. So um, it's Nashon that I'd like to speak about today. His name is spelt. It's three different times in the King James Version, I guess. Um, and he's referenced in 11 verses, I guess, and um, 13 times total. Interestingly enough, almost every time that he's mentioned, it's really just in a list. And you wouldn't think you would get very much just from lists. But at the same time, um, as I went through it, I just was thoroughly encouraged with the little pieces that come together as you consider this story. And more than anything, what I was really blown away with as I, I dug into it was the, the grace of the Lord in that, this story. So the first verse I'd like to read is in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 3. I'll start with Judah and go down through. Actually, we'll start right at verse 1 and go from there. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Perez, and Perez begat Zerah of Tamar. And Perez begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Naasson or Nashon. And Naasson begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. So um, actually, I may have said that in, incorrectly before. Um, Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon, he married Rahab. So that, that's what the story that I want to trace today and go into in a little bit of detail. It's also ref referenced in the book of Luke, chapter 3. And of course, in Matthew, you have the lineage through Joseph and Luke, you have it through Mary. But of course, it's before David, so it's the same. So this is in Luke chapter 3 and verse 32. It says there, which was the son of Aminadab, which was the son of Aram, which was the son of Ezram, which was the son of Perez, which was the son of Judah. Sorry, I... I I um, went a verse too far. Verse 32, which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of Obed, which was the son of Boaz, which was the son of Salmon, which was the son of Naasson, which was the son of Aminadab, which was the son of Aram, which was the son of Ezra, which was the son of Perez, which was the son of Judah. So who was this person, Naasha? And that's what I, I want to go through. If we go back, the first time he's mentioned in the word of God is in Exodus chapter 6. So I'd like to turn to that. And to me, just to consider the story of Judah 
and I know um, there are tremendous lessons to be learned in it. We know that Judah failed miserably when he was probably fairly young with respect to who he married and his children, and then he had a number of his children die, and then he sinned with Tamar, and Perez was born, and it was just a very, very sad story that you read there in Genesis. And then the story goes on, and we see Judah so wonderfully caring for his father and, and uh, it resulting in, in blessing at the end of the book with respect to Joseph. And he's given that blessing that um, they're about a, the scepter not departing from Judah. And so you start with this very, very sad story of Judah and his failure, and yet he repents and the Lord brings tremendous blessing. They go down into Egypt and this family of Judah grows from a really, really tiny family to one of the biggest in Israel by quite a significant amount, actually. And Nashon is the prince of Judah. When we read this first verse, which is in Exodus chapter six, all it does is it tells us about his sister. So I'd like to read that. This is in Exodus chapter six. In verse 23, it says there, And Aaron took him, Elisheba, the daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Naashon, to wife, and she bare him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So here we just have his name mentioned one time in a list. It says that his sister uh, married Aaron. And, you know, that's a amazing thing to imagine that your brother-in-law would end up being the high, high priest. And, you know, I just considered a little bit, you know, what a privileged position that this man, Nashon, was brought into. He was from a little tiny or from the, the lineage of Judah, and uh, they had grown to be one of the biggest tribes in Israel. And uh, here he has his sister, and she marries Aaron, who's the high priest. And, you know, we don't read about him again until we get to the book of Numbers. But there's a lot of stories that actually happen between where he's mentioned here and where he's mentioned in Numbers. Um, you have the plagues in Egypt and the Lord delivering Israel. Um, out of Egypt, and they cross the Red Sea, and the Lord um, is leading them into the promised land. And that's where we get into numbers. But, you know, I was thinking, and I didn't realize this, I did a, a search, and I don't, I don't put much stock in this, but this man, Nashon, he is said to be, when the, when the Red Sea parted, the rabbinic tradition says that he actually got in the water in faith, and uh, he was one of the first people into the water. And I don't, I don't really take any stock in that at all, but he was clearly a leader in, of the tribe of Judah. And we don't have that in the word of God at all. But, you know, it's interesting. He would have seen God come in in a tremendous way and deliver Israel. He would have, and I, I assume he would have been probably the oldest in his family, and uh, maybe he would have died if the blood hadn't have been on the door. I don't know. He would have been over 20, as we learn in numbers. Um, but he certainly would have gone through some very interesting circumstances between where we first read about him in a list in Exodus chapter 6 and where we read about him next, which is in Numbers chapter 1. So I'd like to go to Numbers chapter 1 next. And as I said, each time his name is mentioned, it's really just in a list. And this first list is when they do the first census of the children of Israel um, as they start their journey in the wilderness. And they do, they number the tribes, and there's over 600,000 um, men who are ready to go to war. 
and they name the men who actually lead um, in each one of the tribes. And that's where we read about Nashon. So let's just read about that. This is in Numbers chapter one. Actually, I'll, I'll start at, at chapter, at verse one. The Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month, in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families and by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And with you there shall be a man of every tribe, every one head of the house of his fathers. These are the names of the men that shall stand with you, of the tribe of Reuben, Eliezer, the son of Shedder, of Simeon, Shel, Umiel, the son of Zerashadai, of Judah, Nashon, the son of Amminadab. So here we have him named, and he is the head of the tribe of Judah. And what you have as you go through is the first thing they do is they take the number of how many people were in each one of the tribes. I was interested back when I was in university, actually, I was reading numbers. I actually just put into a spreadsheet how many people there were in each one of the tribes. And Judah has the largest number of people at this point. So they went from Judah failing miserably to, at this point, having more than anyone else. And I just like to read that verse. And that is in Numbers 1, verse 26 and 27. So just further down in the same chapter, it says, Of the children of Judah, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of their names, from 20 years old and upward, all that were able to go forth to war, those that were numbered of them, even of the tribes of Judah, were three score and 14,000. In 600. So you have here 74,600 men. And if you go through and just take a look at the numbers of all the tribes, Judah is the largest tribe by over 10,000. And Nashon is um, the prince of that tribe. And you know, it's remarkable the position that he had been brought into, not only had his sister married the high priest, but he was the leader or the prince of the largest tribe in Israel. And uh, it's, he, he would have seen what the Lord had done and just a tremendous position to be in, the blessing that was there. And whether he would have recognized the, um, the blessing that Jacob gave, I don't know, but, uh, Certainly, um, it was remarkable, and it goes even beyond that, because when you go to the next time that it's mentioned, which is, again, in a list, if you go over to Numbers chapter 2, in verse 3, here it gives how the tribes are organized um, around the tabernacle, and it gives the placement of each one of the tribes. And Nashon is mentioned as the leader, not only of the biggest tribe, but also of the biggest three tribes or the, the biggest group, the biggest quadrant, you might say. So let's just read that. And it's remarkable to me to see that as well. So this is in Numbers chapter two. Actually, I'll start at verse one there again. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. On the east side, towards the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies. And Nashon, the son of Amminadab, shall be captain of the children of Judah. And his host, and those that were numbered of them, for three score and 14,600. So there you have the 74,600 again. And then you have the two tribes that were with them. Those that do pitch unto him shall be the tribe of Issachar. Nathaniel, the son of Zuar, shall be captain of the children of Issachar. 
And his host and those that were numbered thereof were 50 and 4,400. Then the tribe of Zebulun and Eliab, the son of Helon, shall be captain of the children of Zebulun. And his host and those that were numbered thereof shall be 50 and 7,400. And not only were these other two tribes with Judah, they were actually some of the biggest tribes as well. And then it says in verse 9, it says, All that were numbered in the camp of Judah were 100,000 and fourscore thousand and six thousand and four hundred throughout their armies. These shall first set forth. So this group of three tribes would travel together and um, it refers to them as the camp of Judah, of course, which Nashon was the, the leader of, and they would be the first ones to set forth. So here we have this man, not only was his sister married to the high priest, not only was he from the biggest tribe in Israel, not only was he from, he was also from the biggest group, the first ones that that set out and uh, when they went, when they traveled. And so again, he was in a tremendous position. You can see here of the 186,000, um, that's almost a third of the 600 and some thousand, a little less, I guess, but certainly in a very, very, very privileged um, position overall. And uh, again, his name's just in a list, but there's a little bit to glean there. And if we go to the next time we read about him, this is over in, you skip a few chapters here, but you'll go over to chapter seven, Numbers chapter seven. And in Numbers chapter seven, we have the tabernacle is being set up. And you think of what a privilege it would have been. The Lord, the Lord said that he wanted to dwell among the children of Israel. And um, they built the tabernacle. And here they're bringing a gift to the Lord when the tabernacle is set up. And it's very interesting to me just to read this, this story and to consider what an incredible thing it was um, for the Lord to desire to be in their midst and for them to be able to travel with him there. And here they're bringing a gift to him. And who do you think the first person to bring a gift at this, at the setting up of the tabernacle was? Well, it's national. So again, he's in a tremendously privileged position. And uh, so let's just read these first verses in Numbers chapter 7. It says there, came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and, the sanct and sanctified it, and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were princes of the tribes, were over them that were numbered offered. And they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered wagons and 12 oxen, a wagon for two princes and for each one an ox. And they brought them before the tabernacle. And the Lord spake unto Moses, take it of them that they may do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt give them unto the, the Levites to every man according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon according to their service. Four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari according to their service. And under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. But unto the sons of Kohath, he gave none because of the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them, was that they should bear upon their shoulders. And the princes offered for dedicating of the altar in that day that it was anointed, even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said unto Moses, they shall offer their offering, each prince on his day for the dedicating of the altar. And this is a very interesting chapter. I don't know, every time I read through the Bible, I find it very interesting to consider. It repeats these verses over and over and over again as the princes bring their gift 
to the Lord at the setting up of the tabernacle. Um, but the first person here, let's just read what it says here. It says, he that offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Aminadab of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver charger. The weight thereof was 130 shekels, one silver bowl of 70 shekels. After the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them were <clears throat> full of a fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, one spoon of 10 shekels of gold full of incense, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering, one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and for a sacrifice of peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Aminadab. So here we have Nashon, the first person to bring a gift at the setting up of the tabernacle. And you think of what an incredibly um, privileged position that was to be able to do that. It's interesting here that it actually, it doesn't refer to him as a prince and it does for all the others. It says, he that offered his offering the first day was Nash on the son of Aminadab of the tribe of Judah. And for all the others, it specifically mentions that they were princes. And uh, it has, it's interesting. And I don't, again, I don't put much stock in it at all. But according to um, Jewish tradition, it said that he brought the gift himself. Now, I don't think that that's really the case. But the amazing thing was, is that he was the first one to bring this gift at the setting up of the tabernacle. So again, here we have this man, Nashon, and uh, he has this incredible privilege of being able to, to bring this gift when the tabernacle is set up. Okay, so the next place that we read about him is in Numbers chapter 10, and in verse 14. It says there, here in this chapter, chapter 10, it's talking about how they travel. So not only, um, not only was he from the biggest tribe, not only was he from the biggest three tribes, um, but he was also the first to bring his gift to the tabernacle when the tabernacle was set up. And here, his tribe is the first tribe that heads out when they travel. So I'd like to go back just actually to the previous chapter, which is where the cloud comes and guides them on their journey. So if you go back, it says, and so it was when the cloud abode from evening, even unto the morning, that the cloud was taken up in the morning as they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night, that cloud was taken up and they journeyed or whether it were two days or a month or a year, that cloud tarried upon the tabernacle and remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. And when it was taken up, they journeyed not. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents and at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept their charge. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So here we have this incredible thing where when the children of Israel were traveling or, or journeying, um, the, the, they had the, the cloud that went before them. And the interesting thing to me, and let's just read that Judah is the first tribe to travel. And I would assume that Nashon would have been at the front of that procession. So let's just read verse 14. It says there, Actually, we'll read chapter 10, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to see the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow, but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie in the east part shall go forward, which, of course, that would have been Judah. But when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey, and they shall blow an alarm in their journeys. And then if you go down to verse 14, this is really what I wanted to get to. It says, in the first place, 
went the standard of the camp of Judah, according to their armies, and over his host was Nashon, the son of Aminadab. So not only um, was he the biggest tribe, the biggest three tribes, the first to bring his gift. Here you have him. When they set out, he was right behind the cloud and I believe the ark, and he would have been following there right at the head. You think of what an incredibly privileged position that was to be in. And, you know, I, I reflect myself just on the position each one of us has been brought into as believers. You know, we have sinned perhaps a little bit like Judah, and yet the Lord in his mercy and grace has picked each one of us up and saved us and brought us into an incredible position. You know, his life was probably spared with the Passover. They were rescued from Egypt and brought across the Red Sea. The Lord was guiding them. He was there in their midst. And so you have this man, Nash, on. You know, I can hardly imagine a more privileged position to be in. But you know what the amazing thing to me is? I was just considering when I first started thinking about him, is he was not there when the children of Israel went to Jericho as their first conquest in the land of Canaan. And I think we all know the story of how, and it's a very sad story, the whole 600,000 men perished, except for Joshua and Caleb, perished over the next um, 40 years. And uh, Nashon would have been one of them. The Bible doesn't tell us when, it doesn't tell us how, and I've, I hesitate a little bit just to give you my thoughts on this, because it really is silent. But you know, if you go to where we just read, which was the 10th chapter, and then you go a few more chapters forward, and you just look at what happens in those chapters, you see the children of Israel, they lust for flesh in chapter 11, and some of them die there. And then you see um, Miriam and Aaron, which would have been his brother-in-law, um, speak against Moses because of who he had married. And you see a sad story there. And you know, it doesn't say anything about Nashon in either of those situations. And then we get to the 13th chapter. And again, it still doesn't say anything about Nashon in the 13th chapter. And you have the 12 spies that are selected to go spy out the land of Canaan. And of course, Caleb and Joshua were there, but from the tribe of Judah was Caleb. So if Nashon was still alive, I am sure he would have, he would have known Caleb no matter what, I'm very sure. Um, <clears throat> but he travels, so, sorry, the spies go into the land and they spy out the land for a period of time. And um, they come back with 10 of them not wanting to go in, but Joshua and Caleb stilling the people. And, you know, I've asked myself the question, where was Nash on when that happened? It's possible he died earlier, but it's probably more probable that he was there. He was in the most privileged position you could possibly be in. And when someone from his very tribe who wholly followed the Lord said, yes, let's go, it's just silence. And, you know, the Lord says that all those who were able to go forth to war were going to die except those two. You know, I can hardly comprehend that story. It's one that is, I don't even know how to say it, um, just incredibly sad. And, you know, they are sad when they're told that they failed so miserably. And I was just thinking as I reread this story a little bit, you know, they go ahead and try and fight themselves 
because they think they can rectify the situation, but Nashon wouldn't have been following the ark. It says the ark stayed behind. He wouldn't have been following the cloud because it says the cloud stayed behind. And, you know, I just think of the sadness of that situation. And, you know, if that's where this story ended, this would be a terrible story. You have a man who is brought into tremendous blessing after his family failed to perhaps the peak of what you possibly could imagine. And yet the Lord in his grace brings him into his lineage. You know, I don't know exactly how the Lord did that. I don't know what happened. I've wondered, you know, Nashon's son, Salmon, married Rahab. Whether Nashon recognized that he had sinned and repented and he told that to his son, I don't know. But we do know that his son recognized the faith of Rahab and he married her. And you know, the family was brought into incredible blessing because of that. You know, I thought, and again, I don't mean to go beyond scripture. It's not something I intend to do at all, but I mean, his son would have been at the front of them as they traveled, perhaps as they approached Jericho, I don't know. I don't know exactly how close Gilgal was to Jericho, but he would have seen that scarlet line hanging in the window and recognized here was somebody who had faith. And whether he learned that faith or you heard the stories from his father of what the Lord had done, I don't know. But it's incredible to recognize that the Lord brought this man Nashon back into blessing again through grace. And it, it, it amazes me as you look at the lineage of the Lord, when you look at a Judah and a Tamar, when you look at a Rahab and Salmon, and when you look at a Boaz and Ruth, and when you look at Nashon, to see what the Lord did is absolutely incredible. You know, let's just go to the <clears throat> um, next time where... Uh, or let's go to Ruth chapter four. Let's just read that. This is where it connects. Salmon to Nashon. This is in uh, Ruth chapter four. It says there, now these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begot Hezron. Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Nashon, Nashon begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, Jesse begat David. So we have this little snippet where it traces the lineage from Judah to David, and right in it, you have this man, Nashon, and his son, Salmon, mentioned. And you know, we wouldn't know, and I was struck by this when I recognized it, the Jews actually don't know that Solomon married Rahab because it's only mentioned in the New Testament. Now, of course, if they've read Matthew or they've met, read Luke, they would recognize it from there. But it's beautiful to see in the New Testament, grace is brought out in an incredible way where Nashon's son marries Rahab. He must have recognized when they went into the land of Canaan um, that the Lord, um, that there was, that the faith that Rahab displayed was tremendous. And you know, it's amazing to me, after we read that last little bit about Nashon, the children of Israel are renumbered again later on. If you go back, to Numbers chapter 26. So this would have been after the 40 years. And they're numbered just before they go into 
the land. I'll read just Numbers 26 and verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass after the plague, the Lord spake unto Moses and Eliezer, <clears throat> the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward throughout their father's house, all that are able to go forth to war. And Moses and Eliezer, the priest, spake with them in the plains of, um, of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Take the sum of the people from 20 years old and upward. As the Lord commanded Moses, the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt. And then if you go down and you read, um, you actually get in verse 19, the number of the children of Judah. And you know, Salmon's not mentioned. And Nashon is not mentioned either, of course. It says, the sons of Judah were Ur and Onan. Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Judah, after their families, were of Shelah, the son of the Shelahites, and of Pharez, the son of the Pharezites, and of Zerah, the son of the Zerites. And the sons of Pharez were Hezron, of the family of the Hezronites, Hamel, of the family of the Hamelites. These are the families of Judah, according to those that were numbered of them, three score, 16,500. So here you have 76,500 completely different from the 74,600 that were numbered 40 years earlier. And of course, Caleb is still there, but he's the only one. But it's interesting to me, there's no princes mentioned. And you know, <clears throat> I don't know exactly why that is. I've considered <clears throat> the fact that maybe the pride came in there was a problem with Nashon. I don't want to go beyond the word of God in any way, shape, or form. Um, but it doesn't say anything about him here. It doesn't say anything about him as they go into to Joshua. He was probably one of the spies that actually went to spy out the land um, when they went into um, when they went into the land of Canaan. And uh, it doesn't say that directly, but it would make sense in some ways, perhaps, that that was why he ended up marrying um, Rahab. But to me, it's just a beautiful, beautiful story to consider this man, Nashon, and how the Lord brought him back into just a tremendous position of grace, even though he obviously failed. And even though the 600,000 men that he was leading all ended up dying with the exception of Two. No, I shouldn't say 600, 186,000. And even though he was the first to bring a gift to the tabernacle. And so it's tremendous to me. You know, none of us deserve anything at all. And yet the Lord, even when we fail, can come in and just tremendous grace. And I think, again, if you consider that this leads into the birth of the Lord, and that he was brought into that lineage of the Lord. It's just amazing. And to me, it's amazing as I considered this story, just to think of, here you have a man's name that is just mentioned in a bunch of lists. And yet, if you pick them out one at a time and you go through them, you uncover a story that just displays the grace of the Lord in a tremendous way. Well, that's really what I enjoyed from the story. And I don't want to go beyond it or say too much, but just um, to consider the grace of the Lord and his love to each one of us, that even when we fail, he can bring back, bring us back into tremendous blessing. And uh, we see that through the life of this man, Nashon. And you know, what exemplifies this to me, and I appreciate this reference, if you go over to First Chronicles chapter 2, and this, of course, Chronicles is a book where Grace is brought out in a remarkable way. And this, of course, was much later. And it was written by the Holy Spirit, of course. But it says there in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, it says in verse 10, it says, Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, um, prince of the children of Judah. And Nashon begat Salma, and Salma begat Boaz. So here, Nashon is referred to 
as the Prince of the Children of Judah. And that was the title that I had made for this talk, just that Nashon, Prince of Judah. You know, the Lord himself here records this man later, even after he had failed, as a prince of the children of Judah. And to me, that is just incredible to consider. And, you know, despite our failure, when we put our trust in the Lord, um, we're seen as perfect in his eyes. Well, that's really all that I had um, for today. I know it's not the full hour, but uh, maybe we could just close in prayer.